into it. The last thing Grady told me was make sure you push the red button. You got the red button? I get up here and I already forgot. Right. Pastor, what do you got? Hey, you know what? How many of you are aware, I know it's been the both in a couple weeks, next Sabbath afternoon we are hosting a Red Cross, Red Cross blood drive right here. You know, some of you are aware of that. How many of you have ever given blood before? Raise them up. How many still give blood today? All right. How many tried to give blood and went home and ate cream of wheat and then came back? <laughs> okay. So, if you have not given blood and would like to, or if you have given blood and would like to, this is a great opportunity for people to help. Um, we, are, we get the privilege of hosting this event here. Some people say, well, why on Sabbath? I say, why not? Jesus is not doing good. And, and what does, what, you know, what, what's a better thing to do but share life? So this is next week. Next Sabbath afternoon. After church. What After time church. what time does it start? It starts, I believe they're starting their donations will begin at twelve thirty and they will go, I believe, until five thirty. All right, so we can just come to church. You can, you can sign stay up. here. There's a way in the bowl to sign up. Okay. Then give blood and go home and have a nap. And have a nap or go have your meal and have a nap and then come give blood. Okay. Some can do that. And it's not just for us, but People from the local community will come out as well. Absolutely. It's a great opportunity to have people here on our campus, here to see okay. our church and see, oh, wow, it's not just preaching on Sabbath morning. We're giving life, literally giving, literally life, giving life to other people. Do you know how many lives can be saved through one donation? Well, I see one here today. Yeah. Where is he? Where's Tim? I'm sure there was some blood getting pumped through Tim. He's here today, Amen. so he is a living, breathing miracle. Can you just stand up? I know you can stand up, but would you? Would you stand up? Uh, if you don't know the story of Tim, it is a miracle of God that he is here with us today. Um, uh, here he comes. Come Woo! On, we got time for this. Mm. So, you know, and as he's coming up, when you give blood, you save up to three lives. With one donation. One donation up to three lives. I'll let you two, you two yeah. gentlemen have, no, a, have a little sure? discussion. Yes. And by the way, I have, where's Daphne? Daphne, I got something for you. Ooh. This is, I know you're too little to get blood, but I want you to, to know that this is your water bottle for you. Okay? Oh, that's Thank cool. Um, this man is a miracle. <laughs> And, and what a privilege to have Tim back, to have you back again amongst us Thanks. today. I wasn't expecting, I thought, well, it's going to be a couple weeks. Today. Yeah, no. Yeah. Can't, can't um, keep me down. I gotta get up. <laughs> just really quick, I'm not gonna have you go into the whole story. Yeah. But just, what is going on now? How's your, how is your healing process going? I uh, started uh, rehab this week uh, down at uh, St. Al's, and so they've got me at uh, 30 minutes on Mondays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, working lower body right now to my sternum hills, and then we'll start with upper body after six or eight weeks have gone by. Okay. Just a, just a quick background. You had your heart opened up four times. Three. three it was times. three, yeah. Three times. Yeah. Okay. The chest. The chest. The chest. Yeah. the chest opened up three times. Yeah, in one and, month. Uh, in so. one month. Most people don't go through that in a lifetime, but we're glad that you were able to get through it and you're here with us. Yes. Um, any guitar plans in the rehab? I'm going to be here next week playing guitar. Oh, amen. But you can just sit down. You can. Okay? I'm going to bring my stool. I'm going to okay, sit down. I won't good. stand the whole time. Go ahead. So you said you went to Home Depot yesterday to pick up the light bulb. I did. One Tell light bulb. Us that story. I was there for an hour and a half. I used to work there, and people just out of the woodworks. I mean, first of all, I want to thank everybody here for your prayers. So I wouldn't be here today. I call it my hurricane of prayers. They just, I had some as far away as I was reading it through different posts from New Zealand. I mean, just crazy. But there were people there that told me that, yeah, I don't usually pray, but boy, I was praying for you. That was like, wow. <laughs> I felt that. People were praying for Tim. Yep. He went to get a light bulb and they had to make sure he knew it. Oh, yeah. Hug. <laughs> yeah. It came through. I mean, just hugs from everybody and just, yeah. yeah. Just uh, even witnessing from their side, was, to me, it was just like, yeah, what they saw. So. Amen. How can it's we be cool. praying for you, Tim, going forward from today? Um, just to we're gonna not stop. get my strength back and, of course, you know, uh, don't know what's working. I, I did, you know, apply for disability. We'll see how that comes through to, to kind of help. Right now, I um, have some good friends that set up a uh, fund with GoFundMe and 
and raised quite a bit of money for us, so that's seeing us through the next few months. But uh, medical bills, of course, are starting to come in, but that's to be expected. But insurance I had is doing a pretty good job with that, too. So. Amen. Tim? Yeah, so just, just the months ahead. I mean, I don't know what lies ahead. I didn't know what lied behind when all this happened either. So, so every day is a new experience. Jim wants to say something to you. I want to ask Tim, what did your T-shirt say when you got off the airport? It said, I survived heart surgery. What's your superpower? <laughs> so, yeah. My stepson had got that for me. So. Anything else you want to say? I think that's it for now. Okay. Holding it together. So, yeah, we'll see you again. Wow. How about another, another hand, not for Tim, but for the God who healed him? <laughs> Woo. And God would continue to be with you, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to run through the, the slides. That's where we kind of have our announcements. Um, just always want to thank the people who make this church a family and who show up and say, how can I help? I mean, is that not music to the ears of the people in charge? How can I help? So I read this story and I thought, you know, I'm going to try to say that. I'm going to try to say, how can I help sometime this week? So maybe you can join me in that. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's at home. How can I help, Mom? Kids, are you listening? <laughs> how can I help, Mom? That would be a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Thanks for that example. Um, adult busy bags, it's about time, you know. <laughs> you guys have seen this corner over here for years, and, and, and these ladies are saying, hey, we'll share the joy. Joy says we'll share the joy of uh, making something to go. And that brings me, so if you, if you want, it's right here in the back. You can do some crocheting or knitting. If you don't know how, this is the corner, okay? You can learn. And listen, Pastor. We can learn and listen at the same time. Yes. And then that brings me around to the fact that those turn into blankets. Today is baby blanket pickup. Leanne is gracing us with her presence here in the winter from Arizona, spending some time at home for a little bit. Um, and those blankets go to St. Luke's. St. Al's. I'm sorry, I should know this all these years. Um, to St. Al's, and they, they get sent home with babies. Guys, it's, it's like wrapping them up in God's love, and, and you made them. Sometimes here in the church, sometimes at home. Paula, you've been busy. She got a banana box full of blankets coming in this morning. So thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. I know. All right, uh, Academy Days, make sure you check the bulletin. This is called the Bulletin. It has everything you need to know. This church is alive and well and moving and shaking, and there's stuff going on all the time. And if you want to know, it's in here. Youth Rally also in here. We talked about the blood drive. Sorry, Hope, we kind of went out of order for you. And anything else? No, okay, a little bit of business. Uh, we are gonna do the second readings for transfer of membership. Lisa Rogan from here to Seaside, Oregon, where she lives. Wonderful, she's getting involved in church over there. Um, also want to vote um, into our membership, the Godman family, um, Don and Lene, and their oldest son, Gavin, to, um, from Cloverdale to our church. Do I have a motion that we accept these as stated? Second? All those in favor, raise your hand. All right, it's passed. That's the business of it. I've, I've only been here for a couple of hours, and I've already had church. I don't know about you. Our little small groups that we meet in before we come into this big room in Sabbath schools, I was in the hall class this morning. There was just two of us in the hall class. Um, but it, it was just a blessing to me to be in, in fellowship with a fellow believer in Jesus. And that is what we do. That's what we come here for. And, and a time that we take here in this big room is for prayer and praise requests just to kind of get updated. We already did our big <laughs> yay hallelujah one here with Tim this morning. Um, but there are little things and there are other really big things that are on our hearts. And we just take a little bit of time to share those if that's on your heart this morning. Um, we've got some microphones and um, is, is somebody this morning praising God, um, or is there something that we can be praying 
about for you. Make sure you have the, and Joyce writing them down, which is awesome. We will send this all out in an email. Um, so we'll put Tim on that list. And then um, Molly Jo is back there. We live stream all of our services, and she is in the chat room with those that can't be here. She's over there on the laptop um, communicating with them, making sure that they also feel welcome here at CUNA, even though they're not sitting with us in this room. So do you have something from there, Molly? Um, the Betty Blue family, the Ellen family, and then my own. Um, last week I asked prayers for my cousin who is having a high risk uh, pregnancy. She had her baby four weeks early and both mom and baby are healthy and at four weeks early this baby was still almost seven pounds. Seven pounds? And she's a little mom, a little, little mom. That's so, a blessing she came early. Absolutely, because there, yeah. I, right? it, it is. And mom was having pneumonia and other infections, so it was not a good situation. But really, your prayers were felt by her, and they're not a family that it just it meant a lot to them. So thank you. Thank you, church, just for being who you are and praying. It really does make a difference. That's why we do this. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, two prayer requests. <clears throat> Uh, I had to rush my wife to the hospital last Sabbath night, last Sabbath evening. Uh, the doctor's office gave her um, a steroid injection to help with uh, a certain pain, and they gave her the wrong one in her blood sugar, and uh, her blood sugar is not coming down right now. Okay. And uh, please keep her in prayer. Mm -hmm. And me, I've been in pain every day. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, got back problems, my elbow. Um, what else? <laughs> and my neck and stuff. And I went to a chiropractor once already. Mm -hmm. And I'm scheduled to go back um, the seventh of this month. And I'll tell you something. I have a very low tolerance of pain. Mm -hmm. And when he worked on me, I thought I was going to go through the roof. And I'm, I'm constantly in pain. I just can't move my neck or I'm hurting all the time. So please ask God to, for healing. We need healing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for helping out. Anybody else? Pastor Jim? Lots of praises. I mean, I look around and it's, I was mentioning to you, it's almost like a reunion today, seeing them. Crawford's back and uh, Betty's back and, and seeing Tim back and, and I, was Gail here today? Gail's here to back today. Just many people that are here today that we haven't seen and look at outside. The blue sky. God never fails at giving us blessings. Amen. I love to see you sport in green too, Pastor. It's officially March, so green comes out. Yeah. Um, I just have a praise. It was my wife's birthday this last week. And I'm just incredibly blessed to have her. And I'm glad she's around. Amen. Yeah, we are too. Absolutely. Uh, right here. Uh, we have some new folks at church today. They just moved here. I let them know, Irwin and I let them know we were the best looking congregation in <laughs> Idaho. And that they need to come back. And here they are right here. I didn't get their names. I'm sorry because I knew I'd forget. Just it. put that microphone later. right in their face and they'll tell us. <laughs> welcome, welcome to CUNA. What Thank is your name? Thank you. Uh, my name is John Webb. This is my wife, Carol. We just uh, recently moved here from Sacramento, California, uh, over to Meridian. Um, we're present. We're, we're still. Our membership is at the uh, Granite Bay Church uh, okay. in Sacramento. So. Well, thanks for coming and joining us this morning. Thank you. And welcome to Idaho. Don't tell anyone else, okay? <laughs> we love to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you'll, you'll settle in well. This is a, the beginning of a beautiful season here in the Treasure Valley, so we hope that God will bless you in your new home. Yes. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Okay, so I want to thank Catherine, my dear Catherine. I wasn't doing too hot this week, and she really helped um, finally come in out of whatever this was, cold cough thing. But I also want to ask for prayers for Shirley. Shirley is not feeling well and not here today. She looks like she's getting maybe the same stuff. So whoever's spreading it, stop. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, we're going to just have an opportunity now to pray together. Um, I'm going to kneel down, and if you would like to join me just as a kind of a way that we can show God that we are less important, and he is the most important, and we bow before him if we are able and leave these things at his feet this morning. God, you are so good. Um, when we come in here rejoicing, when we come in here grieving, God, and we've got all of that going on today, and we just acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge the sacrifice of Jesus that he poured his life out so that we could have life with you forever. Uh, that is the reason we are here. That is the reason we are gathered together. We all believe that we are your kids. And we come to you this morning as a kid would come to their father and just kind of lay this stuff out. Sometimes we just need to talk it over with our dad and say, it's been rough. Or it's been so good, let me tell you about it. Thank you for this opportunity here within this church family to bring those things together. You've been here in our midst, you know our joy. You've been here as we've rejoiced. You've been here as we are grieving. And I ask God that all of the requests, whether spoken or unspoken, that you would come into our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would dwell within us, that you would walk behind and before us, that we would trust you with each next step that we need to take. Thank you for the, the joy of community and of family and, and for being here in this place with us. We ask your blessing on each family that's represented here and the families that are not able to be here today. We ask your blessing of healing on those who have spoken and on those who have not. We ask for your, uh, the glue that holds us together, that you would be that in relationships that are strained, that you would bring us back together. And God will give you all the glory for these things, and we just can't wait to see you again when you're coming in the clouds. It can't be soon enough, but until then, continue to guide us and move us and instruct us uh, we give ourselves to you this morning uh, for all of those things. And we'll give you the glory. Amen. You can hear that the kids have been sitting long enough, right? Kids, it's time for um, Kids Story. Who's got it today? I don't even. Oh, Rick. Rick's doing kids' stories, so we're in for a treat. Um, kids, grab a basket in the back. They're going to be coming around with their baskets, hoping that you can fill it up with a little something. And that's uh, for the children's ministries here in this church. So thank you. Kids, make sure you say thanks too.
<laughs> I bet you have lots of stories. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Everybody, uh, anybody have any extras? All right. Oh, quick, back there. Can't have any extras. Oh, quick, run all the way to the back. I don't know, you guys. You missed some today. All right, I'm going to get started. Okay, so how many of you guys know the song, This Little Light of Mine? So you remember that? This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, so then we start into the verses. And one of the verses, you remember, is hide it under a bushel, no. Very good. Now, you all know what a bushel is? For years, I thought it was saying hide it under a bush. But then I always thought that was weird because it had just light the bush on fire. So that's not right, but it's bushel. So for those of you who don't know, a bushel is a big basket that traditionally apples come in. So you have this big basket. So we don't want to hide our candle, our light, under the basket. And does anybody know what the light is? So it's Jesus' love. Right. So keep that in mind as I tell the rest of this story. So this story is about Ben when he was pretty small. We all like stories about Ben. Uh, and he, no, Ben does not like stories about Ben, but, you know, he doesn't get a vote. So, <laughs> all right. So... How many of you guys have maybe tried having a lemonade stand? Anybody tried having a lemonade stand? You want to have one. Okay, so Ben decided that he and a couple of his friends, they decided they were going to have a lemonade stand. And so they put the lemonade stand up and they got the lemonade stand and everything, but it didn't do very well. Because you know why? Because they drank all the lemonade. <laughs> So that didn't work out very well. So they decided later that they were going to try it again, but they weren't going to have lemonade because they, you know, were just going to drink all the lemonade. So they decided that they were going to have a stand and they were going to sell fish. Now, I'm not entirely sure why they were going to sell fish. That's not actually pertinent to the story. But the, the important part of the story is they decided they were going to have this fish stand and they built it in the backyard. Now, do you think they were going to get very many people wanting, if there were people around who wanted to buy fish, do you think they would have gotten very much business in the backyard? No, because no, nobody knew that the stand was in the backyard. So, think about it. That's where the, the song comes back in. I think we could have another verse to that song, build it in the backyard, no. <laughs> so... This is a lot like their lemonade stand or their fish stand. It's a lot like Jesus' love. It needs to be out there where people can see it. And we need to show it so people know it's there. And they want, an, they want some of it also. So I want you guys to think about that. You can go back to your seats. Happy Sabbath. I told you it'd be good. It's great when there's a kid's story that grown-ups can learn from. And it's generally that way <laughs> in this church. We can all learn something from that. I think we've all tried to, to build a lemonade stand in the backyard, or a fish stand in the backyard. So let's be a little courageous with our faith. Um, our offering this morning, this is just another opportunity that we have to worship. It takes all these different forms. We're talking, we're going to be singing, we've, we're going to hear from the Word of God and from uh, what God has put on Pastor's heart to share with us this morning. And another way that we participate is by giving. And uh, we're going to have that opportunity now. The uh, offering this morning is for the church budget. It's kind of how we take care of our stuff around here, pay our bills. If you are visiting, please just be. Uh, don't feel like you've got to put something in there. This isn't like an admission thing, okay? So just be our guest this morning. And for those of us who have planned something, that's, that's what we're doing today is the church budget. So if you could come forward.
Oh, we got another little helper. Yes. Good. God, we come before you with our purses and our wallets and the acknowledgement that it's all yours anyways. And we ask that you would give us loose hands this morning and in the things that you call us to invest um, our money in. We ask that you would take this money, that you would multiply it, that you would use it for your good as this church is continuing to minister within and also without um, our community, and that you would um, that you would bless it and bless those who are giving as well. Thank you. Amen.
I have really enjoyed hearing little calyx today. Thank you. How many of you heard him say amen more than a couple times? Amen. Amen, calyx. Amen. Our children are a blessing. Our children are a blessing. I just learned something yesterday. I had, you know, I knew what I was speaking on and I had all my thoughts together, but I just learned that yesterday, I don't know where I saw it, from sundown, get this, from sundown last night to sundown tonight, we all know what that is, right? We have learned over, whether we're brand new to it or we've been walking this way for a long time, that God set aside a day and he called it the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday night. But did you know that yesterday was the first, from sundown last night to sundown tonight, God is good. This is National Unplugged Day. Did you know that? And so the plea is, is put aside your phones and spend, put aside your gadgets and spend time with those that you're close to. Get connected again. We know in our world today, and particularly in our society, we are very disconnected right? Uh, people are saying, I, man, I'm just so busy, or I gotta, I gotta do this and I gotta do that, or how many of you have gone out, okay, true confession time, you've gone out to dinner, or even dinner at the table, and the gadget is on. All right. It's okay to confess it. I've done that too. And, and how many of you have done this? Sometimes it's fun to go just to the mall and kind of people watch, and people walk, and they might be a group of them, and they don't have to be all high schoolers, but they walk together with their phones. They might even have their arm in arm, they're a date, and they got their phones, and they're doing this. And they're probably just talking to each other. Rick is doing it right now. So National Unplugged Day, and I thought, how cool that the world is learning of a time that we can be unplugged. God, way back in the beginning, gave us that permission, didn't he? And he set aside a universal day that all could come away from the world and be connected to him in a deeper way. And that invitation is still open today. And that's why we're here. Not just to go to church. Not just to sing songs not just to say we did our duty. I hope that's not why we're here. But because we have heard the invitation to set aside the world and come and be with our God and to spend time with him. This God, as I've mentioned the last couple weeks, he owes us nothing, but he gives us how much? Everything. We don't deserve it, that song that I shared with you. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it, but he gives it anyway. Last week I shared about how we respond to that. We give God glory. One of the ways we do is with the things that he gives us. He gives us money, and our response, he's given us a way to respond, not because he needs money, but because he wants unselfish hearts. He gives us a permission to partner with him in sharing the gospel. So when we return our tithes, which is different than offering, that goes to support the work of the gospel. When we return our offerings, that goes to the specific things like the church budget and, and Camp Ida Haven and the building fund and things like that. All part, and I appreciate what Tristy shared, it's an act of worship. God says, when you do this, done from the right heart, a cheerful heart, you are entering into a special place with me. The Sabbath is no different. This God who gives us nothing, gives us everything but owes us nothing, we give him glory by how we honor him and spending the Sabbath that he has given with him. When we enter into his rest, we are giving him glory. Sometimes the Sabbath command is looked at simply as another thing to do like other commands, right? Oh, I got to do that. By the way, how many of you had to be reminded this morning not to steal? 
How many this morning had to be reminded to wake up next to your spouse and not someone else's? <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> How many had to be reminded not to murder this morning? The Sabbath command, yes, it is a command, but when it's seen rightly, what a privilege is understood of what God has given us. It's an opportunity. So I want to review a little bit about Sabbath. We're not going to spend a lot of time looking up all of these verses. If you'd like to know what they are, I can give them to you again, or if you just want to jot these down, I'm going to run through some rather quickly. And there will be verses we will look up, but at the beginning here, when someone thinks about the Sabbath, and honoring God by how we spend our time with the Sabbath. The first place that Sabbath comes to mind is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. The creation week has ended, and God says at the end of that week, I'm tired. No, he doesn't say that. But it says that, that he set aside the day to be a day of rest. We can understand that because it says, he rested from his work, and he blessed the day, and he made it holy. God did it. He blessed the day, and he sanctified it, meaning he put his signature on it, and he said, this is a special day in honor of what he had just done for us, creation. In Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, which uh, were just read by Daphne so well, we are given a command to keep the Sabbath as a reminder of our God as creator. They had been in Egypt for generations, and you know what happens when you walk away from God and you, we see it in our country today. When we, when we see people that haven't walked with God, it doesn't take too many generations before people don't know who God is. And they start serving and practicing all kinds of crazy stuff. And God in his mercy said, I've got to bring them back. I've chose these people through Abraham. I made a pr promise to stay close to them. How am I going to bring them back? He wanted them to remember one of the things in those commandments was the Sabbath day. It's the only commandment with a reminder that this is important. Remember the Sabbath, he says. When you remember the Sabbath, according to Exodus 20, 8 through 11, you remember that God is creator. There's no evolutionists if you understand God as creator. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15, we see the Sabbath commandment coming up in the Decalogue or the commandments again. This time it's presented a little bit different. Yes, it says remember the Sabbath day. Yes, it says don't work and don't let your servants work and so forth. But it says remember that I'm the God who brought you out of where? Out of Egypt. We're reminded that God is our deliverer in the Sabbath command of Deuteronomy 5 verse 15. Some people say, well, the Sabbath, <clears throat> excuse me, the Sabbath is a commandment for the Jews, right? And I would say, yes, it is, but check this out. It's for everybody. Isaiah 56, 1 through 4, that's a wonderful passage. Look it up sometime. In fact, all of Isaiah 56 is, is a promise. God says, to the person who is a eunuch, to the person who is a Gentile, if they enter into my rest, they are welcome. God says all people are welcome. He invites all to enter into his rest. Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 20, verse 12, when Ezekiel wrote, and we'll touch on this more in a little bit, but Ezekiel, when he wrote, was not a favorable thing as to what he was saying in Ezekiel 20 because he was dealing with the people that had been exiled taken captive, gone to Babylon. But he tells us in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, that the Sabbath is the reminder to us that God is the one that makes us holy. He sanctifies us. And then we find in, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, 27 and 28, Jesus himself declared that the Sabbath was his. When he was questioned about fasting, when he got questioned about what are you doing on Sabbath, Jesus, you know all those stories. He healed on Sabbath. He, he took care of people that were dealing with terrible suffering on Sabbath, and people said, can't you do that any other day? Well, in this particular passage, Jesus has just healed the paralytic that's lowered through the roof, and he forgives sins, 
And they said, who does this guy think he is? And then Jesus later goes on to tell them that the Sabbath was not made, that man was made for the Sabbath. Chapter 2, go there if you will. 27 and 28, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is declaring his right to do what he is doing on the Sabbath. He declared the day was his. He declared the day was a day for healing, a day for caring, a day for compassion, a day for hope. Because the world that he was speaking to at that time had said Sabbath is for this and nothing else. Throughout the scriptures, when the seventh day Sabbath is mentioned, we are reminded that it belongs to God. It's called His Sabbath over and over. There isn't a place ever that I read in my Bible that it is, it is a day that is our Sabbath. It's His Sabbath. The Sabbath of the Lord, the Sabbath of the Lord, the Sabbath of the Lord, the Sabbath of the Lord. The Sabbath is God's gift to us. He gives us this wonderful invitation, and he says, enter my rest. Have you ever thought about it like a weekly holiday? God has set it up. There's no logic to it other than the creator, because there is nothing that says we have a seven-day work week. Some of you have heard this even recently. But God has set it up that we can have a holiday, a divine holiday every seventh day, the seventh day, from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And maybe sometimes you might say, why does God speak on this so much? Why does he give us so many reminders in Scripture? Is God only interested in compliance, in strict obedience? Or could there be something more to the Sabbath that God wants us to grab hold of. And what happens when we don't give God the glory that is due Him by honoring Him and His Sabbath? I'd like to begin by answering that first question with a little bit of history and a little bit of story, uh, the story from the Bible. There were times, you know, that people didn't always listen to God. Imagine that. We find the same problem today, don't we? A lot of people don't listen to God. God had made this promise, this covenant with Abraham, and he said, Abraham, because you have been faithful to me, because I can see that your heart is in the right place, I make this wonderful promise to you. I'm going to watch out for you. I'm going to give you descendants as numerous as the sand and the shore and the stars of the sky, and I, I am going to bless you and be with you. And so God did keep up his end of the promise. Always, always, always. He loved them. He provided for them. He delivered them. He protected them. He taught them. God did everything that he could to demonstrate his love and his commitment to them. Everything. You've got your Bibles. I want you to open up to Ezekiel chapter 20. I'm just going to stay in this chapter for a while. Ezekiel comes after Jeremiah and Lamentations and before Daniel. He would have been a contemporary with Daniel, and a contemporary with Jeremiah, but he was among those who were taken captive. And in chapter 20... Ezekiel gives a brief history of how they got to the point of where they were at. You would think that this people of God, that he went through miraculous powers over and over and over again into the promised land, gave them everything they need, protected them from their enemies, kept kept their clothes from wearing out, gave them manna for 40 years. You would think that this people would say, we are on board with everything, God. Do whatever you need to do. But if you read in First and Second Kings and you read in First and Second Chronicles and you learn the history of the people of God, they're not really any different than people today. They were a stiff-necked people. They were a difficult people. And they always pushed the envelope when it came to serving God. 
And so Ezekiel tells us here, and I'm just going to read through this. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to read through the first 24 verses just to let you get this background. Read along with me in, your, in, in silence, I guess, as I read here. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord, and they sat before me. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel, and I raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob, and I made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. And on that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Then I said to them, Each of you throw away the abominations which are before his eyes, and don't defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and they wouldn't obey me. They didn't all cast away their abominations which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and will fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake, that it shouldn't be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Therefore I made them go out of the land of Egypt, and I brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes, and I showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness." They didn't walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. And then I said, I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my namesake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments. And didn't walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction. I didn't make an end of them in the wilderness, but I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with the idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They didn't walk in my statutes. They weren't careful to observe my judgments. Which if a man does, he shall live by them, but they profaned my Sabbaths. And then I said I would pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, you see the mercy of God here? Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and I acted for my name's sake that it shouldn't be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. Also, I raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them throughout the countries because they hadn't executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. God, sometimes people see God of the Old Testament, they say, he is a, man, he's a mean God. All he wants to do is fight, kill, put people away, separate them, do whatever. And I say, you've got to read the whole story. He's a merciful God. He's a patient God. He's a loving God, a God who keeps his promises over and over and over again. With, when it came to regard to his people, one of the reasons that they ended up in captivity was because they refused to take God at his word and enter into his rest. We know that God had given them many reasons to honor him. If you had seen the Red Sea part, would you start believing that God had something to do with it? If you saw all the plagues fall and your freedom come after you've been a slave for generations, would you think that God deserves some credit for that? And he delivers you into a land that you didn't have, you didn't purchase, you didn't earn, and he says, this is yours. I would hope that we would say, hallelujah, our God is amazing. But they didn't, and our humanness, if we're not careful, we can do the same. 
God has shown them over and over and over and over again that he wanted to be their husband, that they were to be his precious bride. They kept choosing other women, so to speak. They kept choosing other men, so to speak, as if God was not enough. Until one day God said, I guess they don't want to be with me. And he allowed them to go into exile. And we know that they did. And we know that for 70 years they did. Ezekiel 20 verse 12 says, The Sabbath was to be a reminder that God was the one that set them apart for a special holy purpose. And by not giving glory to God, by obeying him, they instead profaned God's name. In other words, they kind of made it like a mockery. God had been withholding his hand. He said, I don't want to send them in there because then I, my name is, is, is mocked among the Gentiles and I don't want that to happen. By not giving God the glory, God left them to walk their own way and they ended up paying a price. So, to answer the first question, is God only interested in strict compliance? No. Because he's a loving God. An invitation. God wants us to obey. He deserves our obedience. He deserves the credit for everything. But for the right reasons, as with anything else that he calls us to do. You see, when the remnant of God's people returned from exile, they came back, and you know one of the things that they wanted to make sure of? We are not going back there again. If you look at the history of, of, of the Sabbath, what happened was they began to add laws to protect the Sabbath. Let's guard the Sabbath. We want to make sure we don't violate the Sabbath anymore. And so they added this list of rules, one upon another. Can't do this, can't go this far, can't carry a handkerchief, can't get a chicken egg, can't do this with your livestock they missed the point. The result was that the Sabbath became crowded out by the rules of Sabbath keeping. And it became something they had to do rather than the delight that it was intended to have. Keeping Sabbath became more important than entering into God's rest. I saw a funny cartoon one time. It showed an Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem, and if you just allow me just a quick little explanation, Orthodox Jews would be ones who would say, we won't have the lights on on Sabbath. The real strict observing Jews. And I'm not saying that that's wrong to not have that. We're, we're going to be very strict in our compliance with Sabbath. And when they saw others, this cartoon had it. There's a car driving down the road. The Orthodox Jews are up on the hill throwing rocks at the car. What do you need to keep Sabbath, they were asked? Just some rocks and a road. See, they were trying to keep people from violating the Sabbath in the cartoon. There is something more to the Sabbath that God wants to get a hold of each of us with. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to Isaiah 58. We're just going to look at a couple verses here. Isaiah 58. So just a few books back from Ezekiel. I don't think that God is simply interested in robotic people responding out of fear to one of his commandments, namely the Sabbath. I think that what God is looking for are people who, when they understand the invitation that God has given, say, sign me up. How do I do it? Let me be a part of it. Let me give God credit where credit is due for all that he has done for me. Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. Isaiah is speaking to people that have been violating God's ways, his statutes, his judgments, his Sabbaths, 
They're, he's predicting, and not predicting, prophesying that they will be going into captivity. He's one that was saying, God is not pleased with this path that we have been on, folks. We're wandering away from him. And so he says here, if you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and if you will honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. God has given us this invitation. He says, come, enter into my rest. He wants us to do it freely. He wants us to do it cheerfully. That's the way Sabbath is to be kept. Think of it like this. You're having a get-together at your house, a special occasion. You invite someone over, maybe several someones. Some of them call you on the phone and give an excuse as to why they can't make it. Some show up, but begrudgingly. And you know that they're not really interested in being there. You just want to talk to them and see how they're doing and get acquainted, but they are so busy and preoccupied and thinking of other things that you know they don't want to be there. Now, if you're like me, at best you'd be disappointed, right? I've made all this food. I set aside the time. I was hoping they wanted to be here. God has invited you and I to enter into his, enter into his rest. A day that he has set aside and said, oh, I hope they come over. I got all these things I want to do this day with them. I have all these things I want to tell them today. I can't wait till they get here. I'm so excited. The Sabbath is not to be a have-to day. I have to see God today. I have to obey him today. It's to be put aside as a special day to enter into a special time with God. A day to set aside the world and get to God, know God better. You see, God has carved out this space in time to teach us, to show us his goodness, to renew us for the week that he knows is coming sundown tonight. He knows we work hard six days. He knows we face opposition six days. He knows we get broken and damaged and confused and tempted, and we face struggles for the other six days of the week. So he's given us the seventh day, the Sabbath, to give us glimpses and glimpses of heaven in this chaotic world. It's National Unplugged Day. You know, the sad thing is the Sabbath is the piece of the puzzle that is missing from most people's lives. The piece that if they would embrace it and understand that God has said, you don't even understand the half of what I want to teach you, the half of what I want to do to renew your strength to give you peace in your heart, to take away your stress. It's the peace that makes us whole because God makes us whole and he is in the Sabbath. One more passage. Mark chapter 2, verse, chapter two, verse 27 and 28. I know we've already been there once, but I'm going there again. Sometimes when I talk about the Sabbath with people, this is what I'm always scared of. Give me the list of things I can do and not do. Well, I'm going to leave some of that to you to find out. Talk to God about it. I know there's things I'm comfortable with and not comfortable with. But I think the main thing is, the first thing must be, can I take Jesus with me here and am I going to take him with me here? Jesus, as I said, has been questioned about his Sabbath keeping or his Sabbath practices. He's been questioned about fasting, and he goes on <clears throat> to tell people that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. 
I think that when we get connected with Jesus, we will run out of Sabbath before we run out of things to do for Sabbath. Spending time with God is never wasted time. Now, physical rest, to be sure, recharging our batteries is necessary. Doing things with our families is wonderful. Spend time with Jesus. You see, we glorify the Lord of the Sabbath by how we treat the Sabbath that he has given us. When we acknowledge God by accepting his invitation to enter his rest and we spend the day with him, guess what? You're going to be blessed because he says, I put a blessing, stamped it right in there. When we learn to not see obedience to God as a burden, but for time with our Savior, then he promises to take us up higher and we will ride on the high hills of the earth. Like taking a walk. How many of you remember back when you were children? And I bet Leanne, you and James get to go for walks sometimes. As a child, at the times that I recollect walking with mom and or dad, especially as a little child, we're going to go to the park today. Or we're going to go to the store today. We walked a lot. We lived in Portland. We, my mom didn't drive, and so we walked a lot. We walked to get groceries at times. We walked to the park. We walked, we walked to church. We walked to school. I know Hope says, yeah, but Dad, you only lived a block and a half from those things, some of those things. But we walked. And while we walked, there was great things that happened. When I was little, I can remember Mom or Dad taking my hand. And even as I got older, I didn't walk hand in hand with them. We still walked. Along the way, I would ask questions, and they would give me answers. I learned how the church bell worked when there was no active bell. I learned that they had done a, a recording, like a, they had sound system up there, and they would play the music so you knew what time it was, what time to come to church. I learned how birds could sit on wires and not get hurt by the electricity. I learned that the park swimming pool was opened in the summer and not in the winter. I learned how to avoid trouble with bad people. And sometimes they would share important information that I hadn't even thought of, like looking both ways before crossing the street and then taking me by the hand when we got to the corner, they would demonstrate. Maybe we were walking to the store, and if, if we did, they would share why we were going there, what we were going to get. And, you know, because as a kid, Tessa, do you ever say, can I get a cookie? Did that ever happen at the store? My kids love that. You know, you go to the grocery stores, and there's usually you go back in the bakery, and sometimes I would, terrible dad, I wouldn't, no, not today, we're not, why didn't I do that? It's a cookie. But you go to the store, and you walk to the store, and you get whatever you're getting, and then when you come home, maybe you get big enough, and you get to help carry things, and we didn't have the plastic bags. Remember, everything was paper bags back then, and Mom would say how to, how to put things in the bag so that the eggs didn't get cracked and how to carry things on the way home so you, the bag didn't rip and break, right? Those little things that we learned. As I look back on those times, it, it wasn't the destination that was all important. It was what happened along the way. Conversations, found coins, we... Telephone booth. How many remember telephone booths? My sister and my brothers, when we went with mom, you know, the, the younger three of us, we go to the store, we always would race to the telephone booth to see if someone left a coin in there. <laughs> Every once in a while, you'd get lucky. Cool trivia that we would learn along the way. Mom or dad would say, do you want to know about that right there? This was built in such and such. The swimming pool, for example, at the park that we lived near had housed the penguins from the Portland Zoo while their aquarium was being built. That's how cold that water was. That same pool, during the Columbus Day storm, one that, that went through Portland, it knocked over the main wall where today there is a fence, and we learned that that's why there's a fence there. They never rebuilt the wall. Things like that. Not only the cool trivia, but time spent looking into their eyes and learning from someone that as a kid 
I knew I could trust. There they are, walking with us, taking us places, believing that they could do anything. I'm sure that there were times that I got tired. I'm sure there were times I didn't want to walk anymore. There was occasions that mom or dad would carry me. But what stands, stands out most to me is that when I was with them, I was safe, without a worry. It didn't mean the world was safe around me. It meant that I was safe. Even though traffic was buzzing by, even though everyone we met wasn't nice, it didn't matter. Because when I was with them, I was at peace. And to top it off, the end of where we're, wherever we walked, whether it was the park, the store, even church, was always worth the journey. Folks, God has given us this most incredible day, this most incredible gift, His Sabbath, for the purpose of remembering, for the purpose of remembering who He is and what He does for us, yes, to rest physically, yes. But what a privilege to know that He loves us so much that He has invited us to Himself to spend time with Him, to walk with Him, to learn of Him, so He can give us hope as He holds us close and keeps us safe, even though all around us is chaos. There is no rest like God's rest. And get this, my Bible, your Bible, declares that the end is worth the journey. My prayer, brothers and sisters, is that day by day, we will give glory that is due God by accepting his invitation to spend Sabbath with him. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. I thank you for seeing what we can't always see, for knowing what we can never know, and for understanding us and loving us anyway. I want to thank you for setting aside a day that we could remember that you are our creator, that you are our deliverer, that you are our God that makes us holy, that you are our God who invites all to enter into your rest, that one day we will be with you forever. I pray, Father, that we would not see this as a burden, not see it as something we have to do, but something we want to do, that we will find peace and joy and a little slice of heaven in this time that you've given us. And may we share this with others, that it is not something to seen as drud- be seen as drudgery or a burden, but to lift our burdens as only you can. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for hearing this prayer. Amen. And if you'll stand with us, we've got a song we're going to sing together.
for the times, Lord, that we have seen this day as something we have to do. Please forgive us. For the times that we have looked at this day as not that important to you, please help us. And I would ask, Lord, that as we go through the rest of this day, 